Welcome to Rio Rancho Unite Methodist Church on this Sunday morning and Trinity Sunday morning. Please rise as you are able to as we go into our opening hymn, number 77 in the Unite Methodist hymnal, How Great Thou Art.
everyone doing today y'all survived the hundred degrees the last couple days we're in a nice cool place so let's enjoy uh, just a couple of announcements um, just to let you know uh, Raquel will be at annual conference so she will be out of the office starting Tuesday for the week um, but if you need something just call the office she's put all you know the precautions in place if somebody needs something so um, go ahead and call the office if you need to. Next Sunday, Mayor Hull will be giving the message, so uh, it should be interesting. We'll see what Mayor Hull has to say to us next week. And we have some beautiful flowers up here on the altar. Uh, Dick and Ruth Kristoff, they're sitting right back there, wave, wave. Um, they are celebrating 57 years of marriage. <laughs> And every year has been wonderful, right? <laughs> Ruth agrees Dick didn't, Dick didn't respond. Okay, that's all right. We all have those ups and downs, but congratulations. That's a marvelous, marvelous milestone. Um, be sure and check out the bulletin. I hope everyone grabbed one. There's some other information about a few things that are happening this week. It's, it's a little bit quiet right now. And uh, just to let you know, we don't get to go on our mission trip to Sacramento. Um, we had a lot of kids that had to go to summer school, had a few kids that ended up having to go on vacation with their parents. Imagine that, having to go on vacation. And so we didn't have enough kids in the end to make the trip feasible. So we're not taking our summer trip, but we'll be doing some service projects and stuff like that. So, and um, all the money that we've raised will help pay for the next mission trip, which should be next spring. So just so you know, it's all sitting there ready and we appreciate your support. And um, the kids should talk about their last spring break mission trip um, shortly to show some pictures and let you know what's going on. But summer just didn't work out this time so it's kind of sad we were supposed to leave today but we're doing other things so um, I don't think I have any other announcements other than to be sure and drop your little um, perforated slip in the offering plate along with your offering and Clay is back he's tired but he's back <laughs> so we're he is you're officially married yeah officially married all moved into a new house, raring to go. Um, hopefully in 57 years, <laughs> we can say congratulations to Clay too. All right, we're glad to see you. Hello, we're still waving. We're not doing the shake hug thing yet. And one other announcement we have also, um, for those that were planning on it, there will be no handbill choir uh, rehearsal after the service today. Uh, that notice went out a couple days ago, but we apologize for that inconvenience. Um, some scheduling changes forced us to, to cancel that. We'll let you know when the next one comes up. Uh, in the meantime, let's go into our call to prayer.
Let us go to the Lord with prayer. Creator, we come before you. And, and there are so many things on our mind. So many issues that we are having to face right now. The price of gas, the price of food, the heat, the fires, the state of those who are affected by the fire. And Lord, we as a church are preparing to go to annual conference and, and there are issues that the, for, that the church continues to face. We thank you that Mary Ann Stoik is feeling better getting her stitches removed today and an appointment to follow up on her arm. We pray for those who are grieving. And we pray for those who are, are homeless, those who are hungry, worrying about where their next meal is going to come from. We pray for those first responders and those firefighters. That we think it's hot here. Hmm. And Lord, we pray for the leaders of our community, our state, our nation, our world. Lord, help us to find ways to help one another, even before we're asked to help. Father, hear our prayers for ourselves and for others. And hear us as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, my God. 
about families this month, how do we pass along biblical and family values? The University of Virginia did a three-year study and found four types of family cultures of, of molding the next generation of American families. So we're going to look at the four types. Did you notice your bulletin has some extra lines in there so you can take notes if you want to? You are encouraged to do so. <laughs> so the four groups, the first is the faithful. 20% of parents adhere to a divine and timeless morality handed down through Christianity and Judaism, giving them a strong sense of right and wrong. Raising children whose lives reflect God's purpose is more important than their children's eventual happiness or career success. They are raising their family according to biblical values. The second group is called the engaged progressives, 21%. These parents believe morality centers around personal freedom and responsibility, having sidelined God as the moral compass. They see very few absolutes beyond the golden rule kind of do what you like. The third group they call the detached, 21%. These are the parents that say, let kids be kids and let the cards fall where they may. This group of parents spends less than two hours a day interacting with their children, and for them, a family dinner is often in front of the TV. The fourth group, the largest group with 27% is called the American Dreamers. They are optimistic about their children's abilities and opportunities. They pour themselves into raising their children and providing them with every possible material and social advantage. They view their relationship with their kids as very close and express a strong desire to be their best friend once their children are grown and leave home. So to summarize, we have the faithful who follow biblical standards, the engaged progressive who believe there are no moral stand absolutes, 
the detached let your kids do what they want, and then the American dreamers who are very involved in making sure their children succeed in whatever they want, but not necessarily growing in Christ. So which of these four most closely represents your parenting style? The children, the culture you want in your family. I know there are probably more grandparents here, but these questions impact your grandchildren also. As Christian parents, we have been entrusted to care for and equip our children to live in the real world, and this is a huge responsibility. So how do we establish and transfer biblical values to guide our children and or our grandchildren when they leave home and venture out on their own? Think about your family when you were growing up. What were the dominant values in your family? What are the dominant values you have in your current family? Is the dominant value we're going to put our kids first and make sure they get what they need? Or is it, we'll make sure they get a good education so they can get a good career and make a lot of money? Or maybe the dominant value is, we want you to treat everyone with respect and kindness. Or is it, always tell the truth no matter what the consequences? Or, as a Christian parent, is it putting Jesus first in everything you do? Your home, whether you like it or not, is going to be the place where your values are going to be communicated, intentionally or unintentionally. So our job is to prioritize our values and then communicate, model, and build those values into our everyday life. Prominent theologian John Westerhoff has identified four stages of faith which everyone goes through. He believes we all go through these stages no matter what stage our development is at. So the four levels in a biblical context are level one experiential phase. At this level, we understand God through the experiences of those who are close to us in daily living. We watch our mom and dad. We watch our older siblings, and we learn from them. One of the best scriptures for parenting is from the book of Deuteronomy. Write these commandments that I've given you today on your hearts. Get them inside of you, and then get them inside your children. Talk about them wherever you are, sitting at home or walking in the street. Talk about them from the time you get up in the morning to when you fall in bed at night. Tie them on your hands and foreheads as a reminder. Inscribe them on the doorposts of your home and on your city gates. You have to get God's word inside of you. If you don't have God's word inside in your life, how can you transfer biblical values to your children? Once you get God's word inside of you, you can get God's word inside of them. Not a simple task, very difficult, but you have to be intentional. You have to make an impression on your children about Jesus. And if you're going to be intentional, you're going to have to establish some priorities. Priorities about worshiping, about tithing, about youth group, about Sunday school, about a prayer before mealtime. If we stop and think about setting priorities, think about yourself as a parent in one of three groups. You're a parent who makes your values a priority, or you consider values optional, or you totally neglect things and say, do whatever you want. More than one-third, 34% of Generation Z, those born after 1997, are religiously unaffiliated. A significantly larger portion than, proportion than among millennials, 29%. And those born between 1965 and 1980, Generation X. Why? One reason may be they left home and are going to do their own thing. 
I'm sure part of the explanation is their parents did not make church or God a priority. It was optional. Unfortunately, church is optional in our society. We make sure our kids go to sports practices and games, go to school consistently, fulfill the responsibility in other areas, but not in church attendance. I'm not saying this to make anyone feel guilty, but to encourage you to think long term. If your kids see you going to church consistently and upholding your vows to support the church with your presence, gifts, talents, and service, it is more likely they will do so as they mature. So what examples are you giving your children and grandchildren about God and the church? Our kids are being pulled in, in many directions. And other interests are trying to get their priorities and intentions heard, so we must also. And we must be informal. Deuteronomy says your, culture, your values are taught as well as caught. The laboratory is everyday life. Look at your wake-up time, your meal time, your drive time, your bedtime. That's all part of informal living. Don't, don't. Get them down and start preaching at them. Just live out your values. And you do it by modeling your values. You model by example and repetition. When you walk the talk as parents, it gives you moral authority. If you don't walk the talk and you tell your kid, now do this because I said so, you have positional authority. I believe as a parent, you should never have a higher standard on your children than you have on yourself. You're not the exception. You're to be the example. George Barna indicates 60% of learning comes from watching others we trust. So mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, if your kids trust you, they're going to be watching you like a hawk. Are you living out biblical values? They got to be in you before you, they can be in your children. It's interesting. Um, the kid's father went into ministry when they were young. Eric was in second grade and Tammy was in fourth. And we went to church every Sunday and Wednesday night. And I'm pretty sure when they were in high school, they lived with their father, but I'm pretty sure they went to church every Sunday. Eric came and lived with me after he got out of high school but he very rarely went to church with me. Now, I don't think either one of them attend regularly. I believe positional authority was more in use in our home than moral authority. Evidently, we, we didn't model our faith by example and repetition, and repetition is what causes habits. Duke University researchers estimate habits rather than conscious decisions shape 45% of the choices we make every day. I can say I go to church every week. <laughs> I know I'm supposed to. <laughs> but let me tell you about Scott. He rarely misses a service, plans his Saturdays around worship service. Unfortunately, unless I am in town, he usually goes by himself. Scott and his twin go to church every week, and they're not pastors, and they still see their parents go to church every Sunday, and their parents aren't pastors. It's a habit installed in their family as they grew up. Neither the kid's dad nor I grew up in a family who went to church consistently. So, level one is experiential. You model your values to your children. Level two is association. This is where young people seek to belong through groups. So our job as parents is to guide our children into peer groups which are faith-based. So it's important your kids are involved in our youth program. Hopefully you're getting them around other Christian kids. We have great leaders whom they can look up to and whose lives model their faith. Kim and John, 
great mentors. Hear Proverbs 5. Mark well that God doesn't miss a move you make. He's aware of every step you take. The shadow of your sin will overtake you. You'll find yourself stumbling all over yourself in the dark. Death is the reward of an undisciplined life. Your foolish decisions trap you in a dead end. This scripture talks about when we compromise our character. Your sin will overtake you. It will consume your life. It will control your life. You'll stumble all over yourself. Why? Because you don't have purpose and direction and focus in your life. And if you lack self-discipline, you'll make foolish decisions. At level one, you're more of a, of a caretaker and you provide for your kids. At level two, you're a coach, more of a, of a guide. This is the stage where many parents are conflicted. Now, now, this is my opinion, and you can disagree with me and still go to heaven. But at this stage, too many parents try to be a parent and a best friend. Those are conflicting roles. I, I know my kids like me sometimes. But when they didn't, it was more important to me. They knew the principles which guided our lives, which was to know and follow Christ. Even if they didn't like me, I knew what I wanted for their lives. At level one, you model the values. At level two, you monitor their values, the friends and influences. Who are their friends? These are the ones they meet face to face. Look at their friends. Either they're going, the friends are going to change your kid's life or they're your kid's going to change their lives. You bring them to youth group, fine. When you're out at a sports event, they go off with their friends. What do they look like? What do they talk like? Who are they hanging out with at the mall? During lockdown, we had more control than parents have had in a long time. And now we've opened up again. Who are their influencers? During the lockdown, we were so dependent upon the internet. And honestly, who can monitor their kids 24 seven while holding down a job and acknowledging we needed the internet? Do you know who they were connecting with through social media? We need to be alert to the influences of the world. Today, music is a great influencer. Have you listened to the words of the songs your kids are listening to? Or the internet? Quoting from www.theconversation.com, 2020 has been the year of the coronavirus lockdown, the year of online education, the year of excessive streaming of entertainment, and the year when more people are watching, and the year when people are watching more pornography than before. The website Pornhub reports porn viewing has increased by up to 24% this year. And this may not just be for adults. According to some sources, the average age of first exposure to pornography is 11 years old, end quote. Moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, you need to be aware of the influence of the world which are impacting our children. I, I, I do have good news. At this stage of and age, you as parents still have a major influence on your children, even though you might not feel like it. In national surveys conducted by the National Campaign to Prevent Teen and Unplanned Pregnancy, teens report their parents have the greatest influence over their decisions about sex, more than friends, siblings, or the media. Most teens also say they share their parents' values about sex, and making decisions about delaying sex would be easier if they could talk honestly and openly with their parents. So parents talk 
to your children. They still value what you have to say. Level one, experiential. Level two, association. Level three, searching. At this level, they're ready to leave home and go to college. Your role has moved from caretaker, from coach, to a counselor. This is often a time of stress for Christian parents. Why? We worry about what's going to happen to our children and, and, and their faith while, when they leave home. The, remi the Bible reminds us, I I'm thinking about embroidering this and sending it to my kids. Intelligent children listen to their parents. Foolish children do their own thing. Level three, they're searching, and at this level, they begin to challenge your values through testing and trusting. Testing, this is the time they go through. They question, did my parents really know what they were talking about? I believe my parents' values are old-fashioned. Will they really work for my generation? They're gonna test that. On the other hand, Trusting is the struggle you're going to go through. Are you going to release them or are you going to try to con and control them? Studies show far too many children are entering adulthood crippled and unprepared to face life's realities because their parents never prepared them to handle life on their own. Right now, we are able to see for the first time the results of overparented kids, AKA helicopter parents, who showed up with babies on board signs on their car windows. My daughter commented, why would anyone put that on their car? An invitation for kidnapping. This is the same mom who, who wouldn't let me put their names on their backpacks for fear someone would call out their name at the airport or Fun park. Okay, maybe she had a point. It's all right. Joel Alisea, writer for NBC News, says, parents who continually intervene in their children's lives actually end up producing children who are anxious, self-centered, and struggle with coping with demands of life. Research Research shows more money, the more money parents spend on their kids' college education, the worse grades the kid gets. I could save you some money. Make them work their way through college. <laughs> okay, we're looking at financial ties to our kids, but what about the emotional ties? Have you let your kids go emotionally? When kids are not given the freedom to try on their own, fail on their own, they never learn from their mistakes. Sociologist Michael Kimmel in his book, Guyland, defines Guyland as the world in which young men live. It's an undefined time span between adolescence and adulthood that can stretch for a decade or more. Guys gather with guys, unhassled by the demands of parents, girlfriends, jobs, kids, and other responsibilities of adult life. The problem is they remain in this boyhood stage for many years. This is important because if parents don't learn how to release their children at this age and this stage, they'll never grow up. They'll never learn to be responsible and they'll never learn to develop their own values and move to the next level. And the next level is number four, owned. This is where they own their values. They now have a personal faith instead of parental faith. Level one, we're caretakers, providing for and protecting our children. Level two, we coach. You're helping them make wise decisions. Level three, your job is counseling. You are spending more time listening rather than lecturing as they are searching for their own values. Level four is confidant. 
you're a sounding board as they leave home, as they struggle with the consequences of their choices and their values. Proverbs 23, 15 through 18 reads, Dear child, if you become wise, I'd be one happy parent. My heart will stance and sing to the tuneful truth you speak. Don't for a minute be careless rebels. Soak, your, soak yourself in the fear of God. That's where your future lies. Then you won't be left with an armful of nothing. What's the key to transferring biblical values? Fear God. At level four, you own your own values. One develops one's own values, and those values become personal and powerful. They develop their values. Personal because it's their own value. You know what you believe. You know what you value. It's powerful because you know how to express your faith, share your faith, and defend your faith. Level four happens for different people at different stages, at different ages of life. It can happen when your children leave high school and leave home to face professors in college who aren't believers. Or it could happen when you go through a difficult crisis and, and question what you really believe. Or maybe it happens when you visit a church which is different from the church you were raised in. Some people get stuck in level three. They want to please their peers or parents more than they want to please the Lord. When you know what you believe, it's easier to take a stand for what you believe. And the first person you must lead is yourself. The first organ you must master is your mind. The first value you must develop as Christians is your faith. We can help our kids develop by having a family narrative. If they know the background of the family, it will instill a feeling of belonging. Well, what do your kids need to know about your parents and your grandparents? My, my mom's family actually had better stories than my dad's family. <laughs> my, my grandfather was a sheep herder and this is on my, my mom's side, my adoptive mom's side. And, but my mom's side on my Navajo also had a lot of sheep herders. My grandfather would take my mom out on a horseback ride when she had trouble going to sleep. Her side of the family had horse thieves. They were hung. It's in our family history. My father would read Shakespeare to them in the evening. All but one of her siblings got a college education, and her brother had a doctorate in psychologist, psychology. Education was very, very important to both of my parents' side. Made it easy for me. I didn't have to do household chores. I just said I had homework. I thought I was blessed until I got married and didn't know how to cook, clean a toilet, or do laundry. Their value was education. Both my parents were willing to open our home to strangers. We had foreign exchange students, visiting musicians whom my dad met while he was attending the opera to review for the Santa Fe New Mexican. My mother brought home a couple of homeless people she met outside the grocery store. They even invited a couple of my teachers for dinner. How embarrassing is that? I, I do remember going to pay an insurance bill, and I saw an older couple with a suitcase on the, on the curb. And I said, uh, are you running away? And they laughed. And they came home with us and stayed for two days. We helped them get their bank account open and, and determine where they were going to go next. So what is your family value? What is your family narrative? How did your parents transfer their values to you? How are you going to transfer your values to your children and grandchildren? In our, in our world today, there is a great battle between values. The world teaches affluence is important. The church teaches generosity. 
The world's value is power. The biblical value is service. The world's value is appearance. The biblical value is character. So what's the takeaway? I want you to discuss and develop three values for your family. You need to involve everyone if you want buy-in, so discuss it with your family. Once you dis discuss and decide, then determine how you're going to make these values a part of your life. Not easy, I know. If you need to need a start, make serving Jesus Christ a priority or determine to make relationships a priority, a especially if you have a, a family member that's just plain nuts and you don't want to have anything to do with them. It takes time. So take time to discuss and develop them so you can transfer biblical values to the next generation. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the advice you give us through your word. Help us all to put your word inside of us so we can transfer it to our family. Help us to understand we need to be intentional because the world is spending millions of dollars to impress our children other values. Help us to live our values so we don't have to preach. I pray for the parents and the grandparents who did their best and it did not turn out the way we had hoped or wanted. I pray they not li leave in guilt, but help us to realize today we can say from this day forward, I'm going to walk the talk. I'm going to get your word in me and live a life for my children and grandchildren to see. I pray for every family represented here that we would not give up or give in. Help us to live a life of grace and purpose. This we ask in your son's name. Amen. And now please rise as you are able to as we go into our closing hymn today, number 447 in the United Methodist Hymnal, Our Parent by Whose Name. home would be a place of peace and that Christ's values would be a priority in your life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.